and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast, brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code OxygenAddict. We're also brought to you by FuelByCake.com. That'll be my charity cake recipe book with loads of delicious recipes, perfect for putting together in the kitchen, taking on your bike. Recipes from Chrissy Wellington, Emma Pooley and Rob's Nan. You can get yours at fueledbycake.com for just £10. Oh, my lovely Nan. And we're also brought to you by teamoxygenatic.com triathlon coaching. Helping hundreds of age group triathletes see huge improvements in their 70.3 and Ironman performances. The time training system makes sure that you get the important training done each week in a way that complements the rest of your life. And hello and welcome to the show, everybody. It's uh, it's a cold, dark January day out there today, isn't it, Hells? Very cold and dark and raining. And uh, it's very strange, Rob. It's a Sunday. We don't often record on a Sunday. Yeah, we've grabbed the chance to, to leap on and get a bit of early recording done, which is nice. Um, I have just got back from I'm just destroyed hells <laughs> in bits. I've been I've been mountain biking with my mate Andy. We went up to have you heard of Gisborne Forest? No, should I um, have? Oh, it's amazing mountain bike trail centre up kind of in sort of north of Clitheroe and on the moors up there. Really beautiful forest and amazing trails. So we, we kind of zoomed around there for two and a half hours and I'm just completely wrecked. <laughs> and covered in mud I saw my face in the mirror just after I stopped to buy something at the shop kind of got a weird look from the woman behind the counter and then came in looked in the in the wing mirror thing of the van and thought oh you look like someone sprayed you with a with a mud gun all over your face and neck and chest but I'd changed into different clothes so it's normal clothes completely muddy face <laughs> yeah not good not a good look did you come off the bike or did you stay upright? Did, or? Didn't come off the bike. No, there's, that's the update from me. Getting some coaching off Andy. It was really good. I actually feel like I'm improving a little bit on the old downhill skills. We whizzed down a few of those black runs with, for what for me would have been fairly terrifying little routes and drop-offs and steep downhill bits. And, and it was all right today. So, yeah. That's really yeah. good. Mm, well, Andy's laid down a challenge for later in the year that's going to involve entering an event that has mountain bikes involved. And it's it's going to be necessary for me to not be completely useless handling the bike in order to get around it alive. <laughs> okay, so you're going to have to now tell us uh, what event this is. No, it's to be revealed later. I'm not committing yet. <laughs> but you, you know, know the rule, No, but you don't necessarily have to have signed up for it yet. But what is it? Other people might want it's... to do it. Exterra France. We're going to nice. go out and do Exterra okay. in September out in the Alps. Um, amazing. So it's a nice, easy one. <laughs> no, that'll be fun. Wow, that will be fantastic. Well, they've they've will changed be. the course will this be. year, Andy. Will be yeah. Fantastic. Andy was saying that they've moved it this year because last year one of his pals did it. There was two and a half thousand meters of ascent on the bike course. Wow. And it ended with a fifteen hundred meter straight downhill so to put that in context that's like riding from the top of alp duez to sea level in one go <laughs> oh on a mountain bike on single track in the middle of an exterra triathlon so yeah apparently everyone was just in bits and complaining at the end that the event was just too hard so they've changed it but yeah we're really excited so uh, i guess now i've said it on the podcast i have to go and do it don't i that's course, the rule that's the rule that is the rule um, yeah. Come on, and, and you you gave us a trail last week for, oh, I might be doing an event as well. So if you've put me in the corner, I'm putting you in the corner. What What is it, Hells? Tell us what you're doing. I'm doing the Engadin Cross Country Ski Marathon, Rob. It's a 42 kilometre cross country ski in Switzerland. So are you you're doing what? <laughs> <laughs> a ski marathon? Yes. It's a ski marathon. Cross country oh. ski marathon. It means you have oh. to cross country ski. Yeah even if you can't cross-country ski, for 42 kilometres to get from the start to the finish line. Wow. And it's like a it's a big deal, that one. I don't know much about it, but even I've heard of that one. How many people take part in it? So about 13,000. 
people, right? But it, it's... <laughs> what could 13,000 people with six foot long sticks strapped to the bottom of them, what could possibly go wrong? Nothing. They put mattresses around the trees on the downhill bit, the scariest bit of downhill. They, they put mattresses right. on the trees. So what could possibly go wrong? And that's oh, where... Wow. If you can't ski, like um, me, then um, you're right at the back anyway. So you have okay. to pretty much queue to get up the hills. Yeah. Because <laughs> people are just... Stop and have a hot chocolate. Do they, have aid, do they have aid stations and stuff, like in a marathon? Yes, there are aid stations, Excellent. but they actually have um, hot hot energy drink. Love it. Um, and so I, I did it in 2012. So this... For me, it will be... Uh, oh, you've got previous. I have previous. I, I, is, I didn't know that about you. What's your level of cross-country skiing like? Dreadful. But you've got around a cross-country ski marathon, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. So which most people can't say. Well, okay, so when I entered it last time, it was because I had lived in Switzerland and I had seen photos. Um, I had had one one-hour lesson. And probably oh, you spent are a legend. Two, hour, two other hours on snow. I had done two. Um, oh, what's it called? Uh, oh, I can't think what the word is. But um, shots of vodka beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's when you don't have snow and um, you basically roller skis. Roller skis. Right. Okay. Roller so I had skis. done Got two you. hours on roller skis. Yeah, in southern Manchester, and was just like, "This is a waste of time." Yeah, <laughs> and then went out and did it. And obviously, you got around, you survived. Yeah. Did you have any any mishaps? Did you fall over? What? <laughs> what oh, I've happened? fallen over a few times, definitely. <laughs> um, this is too good. I got to halfway and thought, "That's all right. I I can do another thirteen miles of that." Probably got to about fifteen miles and thought, "Oh." oh. Oh, this so is now. gonna. Yeah, this is gonna <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So time-wise, just to put this into context about quite how rubbish I am. My marathon PB is what sub three fifteen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cross-country skiing should be a lot quicker than marathon running. So the winners do it in about an hour and thirty, an hour and forty minutes. Right, okay. So quite a lot quicker than, you know, the fastest marathon runners that might do, what, two hours, 2.10, 2.15, 2.20. Yeah, got you. Um, my time, 4.40. That's very respectable, I think, to be able to go and do four and a half hours of cross-country skiing on hardly any practice. That's awesome. Just... I thought you were going to say it was like 16 hours or something. No. I, I, I'm I, sure I couldn't get around. I wouldn't have the skills to be able to do it. Do they have uphill bits as well? Do you have to do that thing where you make like a backwards v with your skis and step up like i've seen on the telly yeah yeah that's it but at that point because if you're at the back it's so slow like literally no one can actually ski up those bits you just (laughs) trying your hardest not to slide back down right (laughs) (laughs) and when is it uh something like the 11th of march as in in 10 weeks time yeah (laughs) (laughs) right Seize the, seize the bull by the horns and go for it. Absolutely. But what's even more fun is that, as you will hear in um, this week's interview, is that um, I've managed to convince someone else to do it. Oh, come on. You can't leave it at that. Come on. Well, Lucy Are Gossage you... is this week's interview of the week. And um, I just sent her a little message saying, how do you fancy it? Have you it? convinced Lucy Gossage to go and do this with you? Correct. <laughs> And the other person that we're doing it with, other than like my husband and um, and uh, Lucy's friend Lauren, is um, Chrissy Wellington's also going to be doing it. Oh, good grief! It's like yeah, a who's who grief. of it's a who's who of female triathlon from the UK, isn't it, Health? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do not. Are you going to be responsible for not only promoting, interviewing, and helping the careers of these two fine iron women, but also ending them with some kind of disastrous... No, 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 no. Not having any of that chat. That's negative chat, Rob Wilby. We don't want any of that. It's going to be fine. I'm sure it's going to be brilliant. What could 
what could possibly go wrong? What what are Lucy and Chrissy's relative levels of cross country skiing like? Are they a bit more experienced than you? Well, Chrissy's basically. By, by which we mean they've done more than one hour's practice and Chrissy then. Chrissy did it in 2013. So she's already done it, okay. And and has spent the past week um, on snow somewhere. So you she's... see, that's cheating, isn't it? Cheating, that's, exactly. That is not the oxygen addict way. No, Lucy is definitely going for the oxygen addict way. Right. She's never cross country skied in her life. Love it. And um, yeah, I think she's a little bit scared. Oh, that's so brilliant. But excited and going out the comfort zone. That's going to be fantastic, isn't it? It's a nice, a nice long day out. <laughs> you can see though, you can see that Lucy would like start out having never cross country skied before, get really good at it within the first twenty minutes of the race, and then kind of weave away through the pack, That's... end up finishing top fifty. Yeah. Her and Chrissy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. So yeah, it's going to be good fun. So um, yeah, we will. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about this. Um, yeah, in, I bet. in a few minutes' time when we we'll, yeah. we'll play the interview. So we've got that to look forward to later on. We've got the old Lucy Goss interview coming up, haven't we? Um, but before we get to that, we're going to do some results. And before we do that, I just want to say we want to say thanks to everyone who's left reviews on iTunes. Um, we're up to 127 five-star reviews, Hells. We've had a big jump of over. That's over 10 people in a week, which is just super brill. Thanks very much for leaving reviews, everybody. Up until the end of January, we're trying to get our five-star reviews up to 200 because I've been told that that's a level at which it starts affecting like your rankings and iTunes and stuff. So we're shooting for 200. So everyone listening is like a goal-orientated person, Hells. That's what I'm figuring. They'll go, yes, we can help people on their way to a goal. We'll do that. We'll plug into iTunes and we'll leave a five-star review. If you do that and you leave a screenshot of, re of your review on the thread on the Oxygen Addict Triathlon community page on Facebook, you get entered into a prize draw to win this beautiful coffee table book of the Cervelo story. It's called To Make Athletes Faster by Anna DiPiccio. Um, we've got Anna and Phil White on the show next week. It's going to be an interview with them about basically starting Cervelo in the basement and growing it to the brand that we know today. So that's an awesome interview to look forward to next week. If you're not already a member of the Oxygen Addict Triathlon community on Facebook, you can join up for free. We've got over, I think we've got over 1,400 members in there now, getting the old triathlon chat going. So that's cool. And just leave us a review. That'd be brill. So, Hells, I'd like to give a shout out and say thank you this week to some people. Can I find iTunes on my computer right now? No, I can't. Okay, well, I'm going to say to Crumpy, uh, thank you very much. Lots of inspiration from interesting guests coaching tips that resonate and some great support for charity all delivered by personable presenters and thank you very much to kj owen funky and pete cano and must try harder who says it's their favorite podcast packed full of information with brilliant interviews and um you and i apparently have uh, the rapport's all right rob that's nice to hear isn't it yeah well, thank you for leaving reviews. Again, thanks very much. You really, really appreciate it. And that's helping us climb up those rankings in iTunes. And uh, that in turn helps us get more people on the show and gives a bit of leverage when we write an email and say, hey, Jan Fredino, please come on our show. We want all our listeners to hear a story about you. We can say we're the number one ranked podcast on for triathlon in iTunes, which is pretty cool, isn't it? Marvellous. All right, so results this week then. We've got a couple of things actually going on, some as we speak in live time because we're recording Sunday afternoon. But firstly, a heads up for our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. If you're in the Northwest, they've got a hydration workshop going on in Chester at Pro Physio in Chester on January the 26th at 5 p.m. And there's going to be discounted in-person sweat testing available from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. What is in-person sweat testing, you might ask, Helen? You tell me, Rob. <laughs> it's dead, dead simple, guys. They put a little thing on your skin. They strap it on with an elastic band and uh, rub a little chemical on your skin that makes you sweat. So it's completely painless. And what they can do from this is they collect the sweat that comes off your skin in this clever little vial thing. And then they analyze it. They find out the percentage of sodium that you lose in your sweat. They find out your sweat rate. And so that's two really key pieces of information that you used to have to go to a proper physiology lab to be able to 
basically find that out. So there's a couple of pointers here. You can take their online sweat test on their website. Typically, people who have got really heavy sweat rates or who have got really salty sweat suffer in two ways or experience two kinds of things. If you're the kind of person that their calves and their feet lock up when they're in the swimming pool very frequently, it's likely that you're either a very heavy sweater or more likely a very salty sweater. So until you know what the cause of that is, that was the case for me for many years, it's a dead, dead simple fix. You just have some of their salt capsules or salt tablet drinks as you're training and before you're training, and those cramps, almost like magic, go away. So it's a dead easy fix. I must have gone for, what would it have been, Hells, 15 years of triathlon before we met the guys at Precision Hydration, and they did their test, yeah. and Andy Blow said, Rob, you are the second saltiest man I've ever met in my life after me, and I started <laughs> a company. That's how salty I am. So it's been a revelation for me. No more calf cramps and foot cramps when I drink that stuff. It's also a big deal if you find yourself feeling really sick or really struggling in races, especially when it's really hot and or racing long distance, which again was the case for me. So last couple of long distance races I did in the heat, I ended up really unwell in the medical tent on saline drips afterwards. And ever since shifting to using their stuff, I felt absolutely perky after races on the occasions when I've taken it, that is hells, when that occasion when I left it in the van, oh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. a lot of use to me at Lakesman. Felt a little bit a little bit unwell at the end of the Lakesman. As the couple of people who stopped to see why I was lying down on the grass. Thank you to whoever that was. <laughs> <laughs> so check him out over at precisionhydration.com and if you use the code Oxygen Addict, you get nine ninety nines worth of free product to try. So it's no risk and it's a total no brainer. All right, Hell's results. What's going on right now as we speak? So the first race of the 2019 season is underway. I should say the first sort of Ironman branded race. Yeah. Um, 70.3 Pucon in Chile. The women are still racing, but I reckon um, we will be able to reveal uh, the winner. Um, yep, there we go. Barbara Riveros has just finished Rob but she's in real time her, yeah, she's real just time. crossed the line in real time her, her fifth title there wow. in Pucon in a time of four hours and 30 minutes um we will await the other two coming through but uh, the men's winner um was Brazil's Santiago Ascenso followed by Andy Potts and then in third it was Felipe Barassa of um, Brazil as well. So yeah, the winning time was 3.59. So that's 70.3 Pucon um, in Chile. And again, you always see the photos of these glorious mountains and every year you think, oh, doesn't that look lovely? And yeah. we will be hearing a little bit more about Patagon Man, so talking of Chile, from Lucy Gossage in this week's interview coming up very shortly. Nice. Do you know, wouldn't it be... And no excuses, really. You should just make it happen. Wouldn't it be awesome to go out to Patagonia, do that race, go over to Chile, do that race in January when the weather's horrible here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Road trip, Great. Helen. <laughs> go and do a big south or southern hemisphere um, trip to take in a few races. It would be yeah. Uh, yeah, lovely. Um, Triathlon Australia have tweeted, Rob. Okay. Said, Look who's back. It's been seven months since since his accident but today 2017 itu junior world champion and commonwealth mixed relay gold medalist matt hauser blew the field away at the queensland tri-series sprint race on the gold coast a wire to wire win in 59 minutes and 57 seconds they say welcome back matty we interviewed matt hauser um earlier on in the summer as he was still going through his rehab to get back to fitness following that horrible bike accident. Yeah. It's a really good interview as well, and he will definitely be a name to continue looking out for um, over the next few years. Did someone open a car door on him? Yeah. As he, as he was descending a hill, someone, oh, that's just the worst, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah, poor guy. Yeah, lots of surgery, so that's brilliant to see that he's um, yeah. back and, you know, obviously going to be sort of building his fitness building his form but fantastic and what a confidence booster as well for him uh, to get that win in the Queensland tri series sprint and then another race that's been taking place this weekend Rob in New Zealand um, Port of Taronga half was won by Mike F 
Phillips ahead of Jack Moody and Mark Bostead. And then in the women's race, Hannah Wells took the win ahead of Amelia Watkinson and Rebecca Clark. And uh, Theresa Adam, who we had on uh, last year as well, she was fourth. Good stuff. It's it's nice when there's a bit of racing going on down under that you're sitting here. I'm looking at it going dark at 3.15, 3.30. And you think, somewhere, we're all under the same sky, aren't we, Hells? Somewhere just around the other side of the globe, it's warm, there's blue sky, people are racing. They're not covered in mud from head to toe from mountain biking. Or cross country. <laughs> or cross country. <laughs> yeah. How did your cross country go this week? Do you want the truth? Was it... Was it a soul and lifting experience where you crossed the finish line and thought, I've come to worship nature in all her muddy glory? <laughs> or did you, in no. fact, just want to go and get a shower and avoid being hosed down by a man with a hose pipe at the finish area? What? Where do they do that? I've never had that service. Really? Never. Well, they need to get on it because at the mountain biking place today, there was a guy washing his bike from the back of his car yeah. and he had... You know those like those petrol can things you use to carry oh, yeah, five yeah, liters of petrol like if you run out of petrol, wash. like a little miniature jet wash. Oh, that's good. And everyone in the car park was going, "Where did you get that from?" They're available these days, apparently. So, yeah. I'm thinking, get yourself one of those at the cross country. Charge people a pound per leg wash. You can make your money back in no time. <laughs> oh God. Well, uh, Rob, I can tell you about this week's um, Go cross on, country. Go on then. Yeah. Um, so I did a little warm up before it. And then okay. uh, when I started, I was like, oh, first lap, thought, oh, God, that was hard work. Probably went off a bit too hard. It's okay. I've only got one more lap. Got to the end of the second lap. Oh, no. And I saw oh, these, no. yeah, I saw That's all these people. That's a lap number three. Oh, my God. <laughs> there was an extra lap. Well, it clearly wasn't extra. I just hadn't read the course map. And oh, I genuinely well thought, how on earth, how am I going to do this? Um, okay, not to worry. So I just had to <laughs> sort of grin and bear it. And I thought, actually, it's a long season. No heroics today. Just get through it. Doesn't just matter. You're going backwards, yeah. but that's fine. Just keep going backwards. And um, everyone can, you know, come past. Really doesn't matter. Get to the finish and then go and do a cool down. And uh, jobs are good. And so in honesty... I actually hated the race. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. But well done getting it done, Hells. Thanks. Thanks. And That's, I yeah. Yeah, I wasn't the only you one, You've got to get respect. Hells, I'm going to tell you a story. Oh, go on. About miscounting laps. Oh, so we're in 1988, Helen. It's the Wire County Cross Country Championships, schools cross country championships. And almost exactly the same thing happens. <laughs> Little Rob Wilby, mushroom haircut in what had I been in? I'd have been in year 10 racing the year 11s. Yeah. Come thundering down towards the finish line, catching the guy who was leading. So I'm up into second place. <laughs> I catch the guy who's in first as we get to the, the left-hand 90-degree turn to go into the finishing chute. And I'm like, I've got him. I've got the momentum. I'm in. All my mates were there. The school had taken a huge bus. Everyone was cheering. And this guy just looked over to my shoulders and went, we've got another lap, you know. <laughs> so I was absolutely devastated and ran around the rest of the lap, like 50 meters behind him and finished second. And this guy then turned up at every track meet and every cross country meet for about the next three years, told everybody there what had happened to much hilarity. And I was just like, this guy's going to show up everywhere for the rest of my life. And I'm never going to get away from him. And he was one of those really nice, really popular guys who was really good at telling a story. And he made the story much funnier than it actually was. And so everyone was really enraptured with listening to him. It's like, ah, oh, come on. And then literally seven, eight years later, I was working in a gym. One of the girls who was working in the gym I was really friendly with. And her boyfriend came to pick her up, and it was this guy. And he still <laughs> told the same story to everyone who worked in the gym. This kid here tried to catch me at the cross country. Oh, bless. Did you ever beat him? Yeah, a couple of years later, yeah. He discovered beer, and I was still training hard. I think that would be fair to say. Okay. But there yeah. you go, you see? So good things come to those who wait, and good things come to those who do extra um, miscount laps, maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think I think probably though after I discovered beer, if we'd have raced, he'd have beaten me by a lot more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. I do love a bit of cross country, and I'm not the only one. Um, Ray said did my first park run, which was quite muddy. Guess that qualifies. Uh, Scouse Tim said that he bumped into you, Rob. Yes, indeed. Scouse Tim's was out running along the aforementioned Trans Pennine Trail by my house. I was out for a walk yesterday. And he was doing, there was about 50 people came thundering along. And it was Wayne Drinkwaters, you know, the guy who organises the Manchester to Liverpool, Liverpool to Manchester race. He had his big official recce run on. So there's loads of him coming along and he stops and said hi. So it was dead nice to meet you. Nice, love it. Ian Higginson said that he was in action in the Chilton League cross country um, with pictures of like proper big puddles there. Um, Louise Douglas, uh, Essex League at Chingford time to wash the spikes uh, Richard Giles was in action in the Surrey League he said insane standard he said um, he did a 36.08 10k last week and then he said he was about 170th or so in that race in the um, in the Surrey League oh bless him I think there's a you know when you watch rock climbers and they don't seem to be affected by gravity in the same way that humans are? Yeah. You're going, there's no way you should be able to get up that. It's the same with really good cross-country runners. They're not affected by mud. They can kind of dance across the top of it, a bit like one of those Jesus lizards. If you're a good runner but you've never done cross-country before, you're just in misery, aren't you, as you're trying to run through ankle knee-deep mud? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Oh, I do love it. We've got one more in the Manchester League. We've got one more race. Um, and, and I did see Lewis Eccleston as well. So hello to Lewis. Shout out to Lewis. Good stuff. Right. Should we jump on and do Coach's Couch? Yes. Uh, Martin Deru from Belgium says, last year I entered Ironman Austria and a few months later I got a ticket for Norseman. Yay. There are only four weeks between these two goals. I'm unsure how to go about the four weeks between the two races. So that is my question. How should I structure the four weeks between Ironman Austria and Norseman? Well, Martin, he, he wrote a really nice, uh, really nice email through. Actually, it's got loads more detail in than this. And in it, he, he basically describes what his kind of plan for doing this is. And he goes into a bit more detail and says, Austria was going to be my A race, but now having got a ticket for Norseman, I really just want to get to the finish line of Norseman. That's become my key goal. So his 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 goals have shifted a little bit. And with racing two Ironmans in the season, I think it's always a really good idea to have one that you really want to go for and one that's either a preparation race beforehand, kind of on the way to it, or one that's like an end of season party that you're going to do just for fun. And the mindset shift that happens when you approach it that way is that you, you can kind of... If your first race is the big one, you don't have to have all your eggs in that basket. You've always got a fallback position. But sometimes if you approach it the other way and think, right, this Ironman's the one that I'm using as a preparation for the next one, often that takes the mental pressure off athletes and allows them to kind of... I think a lot of times athletes defeat themselves on the way and put a lot of pressure on themselves. And if they get out of that mindset by having another race already in the future and thinking, well, yeah, this one doesn't really matter. Sometimes you can have a surprisingly good race when you don't really expect it. So my advice is kind of wrapped up in this. It's, it's prepare for Austria, go to Austria as the preparation race to go and do Norseman. And Martin said in his email, I'll, I'll probably back off a little bit on the marathon. That's my plan to try and save my legs. And when I replied to him, I said, that's great in theory, and it makes a lot of sense in theory to think you're going to back off. But a marathon in an Ironman is such a long way and it's so hard to kind of measure any kind of pace anyway that I think you're best sort of thinking, right, Norseman's my big goal. Austria's a race on the way there. I'll just do what I can at Austria. And if it turns out that during the marathon with 10 miles to go, you're in agony, well, then you just shut it down and you walk and jog and have fun. But if it turns out you've got magic legs, give it the full beans at Austria because you've still got time to recover in the four weeks afterwards. So to structure those four weeks, I would say the first thing is we, we can't really put a concrete plan in place because everyone's different in how they recover. But I'd say everyone needs to take at least one complete week and usually a second week as well of just not thinking about triathlon, not doing anything training related other than stuff that's going to stop you being sore. So that first week is all about few little recovery swims if you fancy them recovery spins on the bike if you fancy them just to make your legs 
start to feel a little bit more normal again. And personally, I think stay away from sports massages for like three or four days afterwards because your legs are so sore and tender. The massage person can't really get in there anyway. But from the Thursday afterwards, things start to look up a little bit. So it's one or two weeks of complete rest and recovery. Then that third week, you can get in and do some workouts for fun where you've got a bit of intensity. So maybe some intervals of between three to five minutes FTP just to wake your legs up again. Some easy running just for fun. Some pickups in the swims where you're doing 25 or 50 meters hard. And you don't have to do anything particularly long in between those races because you've already built the endurance to do that. By all means, go out and ride for three hours if you want to, but take it nice and easy. And don't do any running more than an hour in that lead up to that Norseman race because Norseman, yeah, it's an Ironman distance race, but it's so tough with that mountaintop finish. It's more important, I think, that you're mentally fresh and ready to go. The danger is you're going to do a little bit too much in the run-up to Norseman. So that's my advice there, Martin. That's a busy summer. Yeah. It's it's a tough one, isn't it? I think if you if you get that ticket for Norseman, there are so many people who it's it's the kind of bucket list race they want to do, but it's completely dependent on the lottery for entries, isn't it? So yeah. most people who are already in Martin's position have got something else lined up. Um, just take a warm jacket, Martin. That's the other advice as well. Because <laughs> everyone I've ever coached who's raced it or known that's raced it, they've sent back photos from their partner of them like struggling up a mountain pass in the sleet. <laughs> so it's it's pretty, pretty brutal in terms of the weather that can get dished out and how it can change on the day. So you've just got to approach it as an incredible day out in nature and keep your eyes and get to that finish line as the major goal. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really really good um really good advice about that day out in in nature. And also the you know the recovery thing you you've got to be really flexible. I think trying to give anyone a plan for recovery until we find out how you feel is really, really difficult. So you've got to go with the easy wins, which is a plan for lots of rest, plan to be mentally fresh, try to be as kind to your body as you can with not drinking loads of beer straight after the finish of Ironman Austria and getting lots of nutritious food in and, and take care of the basics like that. And I think once you're fit enough to race an Ironman, that fitness will carry through to do the same same distance race again four weeks later. You're just going to have to make sure you include some real tough workouts in the preparation for Austria so you've got them in your legs ready for Norseman. Plenty of hilly hiking, I think, is the key of there. A bit of Nordic walking, Rob. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? Andy's been, been using the Nordic walking poles a lot recently on the runs out on the moors to take pressure off his knees on the downhills, and it's been magic for him. Yeah. I'm a real big believer in in those those poles helping out yeah definitely i know it's not strictly nordic walking but using use of poles can be great for athletes can't it oh massive massively taking them um, some pressure off and oh it's like assistance it's very nice yeah giving its kindness to the body giving a little bit of a break mm. from the pounding that, that running can yeah. do um you said it. shall we hear um from lucy gossage and then you can tell us more about team oa afterwards well, I'll just give a quick shout out now about the team and then we can we can wrap that up. It's just to say that the team is open and you've got until Friday of this week, Friday the 18th of January, until we're moving to 2019 pricing. So until then, you can get in for last year's prices, which is 635 for annuals or uh, £75 a month. Um, you're going to get your training plan. You're going to get access to me in our Facebook group. You're going to get our monthly coaching calls. Hells this week, we had over 50 people on the group video coaching call. Oh, wow. I, was, I was a little bit stressed out, I tell you. There was like three screens worth of people's faces looking in. It was like being on Celebrity Squares. <laughs> Did it last longer because they all had more questions? Uh, it didn't last longer because what you find when you've got the group call is – people answer each other's questions or ask the same questions along the way and kind of go, Oh, I was going to ask that. That's good. And it's more about, it's more about the community aspect of being in the same place and people sort of, Oh, I put a face to a name there. So yeah, it doesn't, it's funny that as, as the team grows, the amount of time it takes doesn't seem to grow because the people's issues are kind of repeat across a group of people, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I want you to tell me about our friend Lucy Gossage in our interview of the week. 
Yeah, well, I don't think it needs a whole massive introduction. 12 times Ironman champion, absolute legend, oncologist as well. Um, Patagon man that she raced just before um, Christmas and won it by a country mile. <laughs> Effectively was sort of her transition from, you know, racing as a professional to not going to be on the start line. Um, well, she says she's not. You'll hear she it. says that now. Yeah. She says it now. <laughs> but, you know, she, she isn't this year thinking, right, I'm going to be doing UK, I'm going to be doing Wales, etc. She wants yeah. to spend um, this year, you know, getting her consultant's job and actually doing a lot of different other stuff. But you will hear all of that in this interview and a little bit more about the Engadin Cross Country Ski Marathon. So here you go. <laughs> here is this week's interview of the week. Lucy Gossage, hello and welcome back on to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. They, we, they missed out on the best bit of gossiping that, that, that we've just had, haven't they? But yeah. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very good. <laughs> we may reveal more later, but I don't think we will. No, keep it secret. <laughs> um, so have you, had, um, have you had a good Christmas and things? And what does 2019 have in store? Uh, Christmas was fine. Um, I'm not a particularly Christmassy person, but um, yeah, it was nice. And um, don't you have a birthday oh, on that day as well? Yeah, I do. I do. Actually, it was good this year. I got my sister to come to park run with me for the first time ever. Normally, every year I go off exercising and everyone rolls their eyes. And this year, I uh, my sister came running with me, which was lovely. And we ran it round together in about 27 minutes, and it was really nice. Um, so yeah. Um, what has 2019 got? So I honestly, I don't know, other than hopefully getting a consultant job and this blooming cross-country ski marathon that you've got me signed up for. <laughs> but other than that, nothing definite, but lots of, um, I was looking at my calendar today, actually, and options, lots of really exciting options and adventures. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of an open book. <laughs> Does it feel strange at this time of year not having all these triathlon races dotted throughout your calendar to be honest I, I never do anyway I, I, honestly I don't um I don't think I've ever had I mean I guess when I was full-time I always had Kona on the the radar but the last couple of years I have haven't planned anything until kind of February and then even then I've kind of made it up as I've gone along and certainly last year because I had I just had exams and so much else on I, I, I really did play it race by race so um doesn't feel that strange but I, I do know that I'm not going to be racing pro Ironman so it just opens a lot more opportunities which um yeah kind of makes it a bit more exciting I think. And when did you make that decision that you weren't going to be racing as a pro in Ironman races in 2019? Um to be honest I I didn't think I was going to race last year um but I realised that I just I just loved it too much to stop, and and that hasn't changed at all, um, which is why retirement's a very loose word. And I, I wrote a blog, and and I will be doing stuff. I I just won't be racing. I, I mean, I I I think I wrote something like I won't be calling myself a professional athlete. And then I was reflecting on this, and I thought, well, actually, I haven't really called myself a professional athlete. Certainly last year I didn't. Um, and and 2017, I was kind of a, a transition year, but but last year, I know I raced in lots of pro races, but it it really was very much a hobby again, um, in terms of priority in in my life and things. Um, so I wouldn't have called myself professional athlete. I mean, what does professional mean? I don't know. Um, but yes, this year I I I'm I'm definitely I've been very upfront with sponsors, and so um I'm kind of reducing that down um and so i'm not i'm never obliged to do anything but um i'm definitely opening broadening my horizons um and want to make sure that that triathlon is still part of my life but not the kind of the massive part that it has been and and kind of there are other races that maybe aren't just all triathlons that i'd quite like to do as well um so make the most of still being fit and still loving it but not constraining myself that's a lot of waffle. <laughs> <laughs> so, would I don't know, would something like Challenge Roth be on your radar at all or or just nothing like that? 
No, I think I, I, I'm not going to do Challenge Roth. It is one of my regrets that I haven't ever done it. But um, I think if I was to enter something like that, I would feel feel constrained to train exactly the same way that I have done for the last two years. Um, and, and this year, I think I learned this year that I can do well with a lot less training, um, which has been a bit of a revelation. And um, my brother-in-law, when I, I said this on holiday, he was like, doesn't that really piss you off? And I was like, well, I do quite like training, so not really. But, um, yeah, I, I can, you can – certainly I, I wonder whether I always used to overtrain a bit. Um, but I think if I entered Challenge Roth, that would just suck me into the – doing exactly what I've always done um, and would stop me. The whole point of this year is to be able to do things that I've never done that I want to do. And, and actually – you know, I'm not saying I won't do an Ironman. Um, I'm not certainly not going into the year with any intention of doing one at all. But I know what I'm like, and you know, I have these whims. Like, do you want to do a cross country marathon? Yeah, why not? So, you know, I'm not crossing my mind three weeks before Ironman Wales. Someone says, "Well, why don't you do it?" I say, "Well, I'm not, but I'm, I'm not planning that." And there are lots of other things that I am planning that will mean that I can train differently and train with less pressure and less stress, and just go and enjoy it. Um, and yeah, see where I end up. <laughs> so, what is on your bucket list then after the Engadin Cross Country Ski Marathon in March, or maybe before the Engadin Cross Country Ski Marathon in March? Um, well, I so I've got an interview for a consultant job uh, at the end of January, um, and if that goes well, then I'm going to have a couple of months off work before I start. Um, so. I don't know what I'm going to do. Again, those two or two and a half months are empty. Um, I want to do a bit of cycle touring, um, maybe a couple of trips, one in Southeast Asia, one in, I don't know, South America or something. Honestly, I've got no idea. Definitely want to do some cycle touring. Um, got the Engadin A Race, it's cross country ski marathon. Got my, my outfit, sponsored hot dog outfit sorted after our conversation. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and um, Patagonia, I did Patagon Man, which was, it was, it was just such an incredible experience, and, um, and actually, it's, it's funny, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but after Challenge, I did Challenge Pagera, I did, I, after Wales, I did 70 Quickly in Lanzarote and Challenge Pagera, and I, I didn't expect to do well in either of them, and I entered them purely because I knew I had Patagonia, and I, I didn't really want to train, and I, I just thought, well, I'll do some races, and that'll keep me fit, um, but I ended up winning them, and my sister and mum were at Challenge Pagera, and, and Harriet, my sister, was like, you're not going to retire after this. Um, and actually, it would have been quite hard to... to re- I'm saying retire in inverted commas, but it would have been quite hard to stop doing what I've always done, having just won a couple of races. Because obviously, you're making money from it, and I've got good sponsors, and um, if you love something and you're making quite a lot of money from it, it's quite hard to step away. But um, Patagonia was just the best possible way to to help me kind of make the transition that I'm making of doing stuff just purely for fun because it catches my imagination because it was it was so different and you're just on your own it, it, they, no one's cheering you I, mean, I won it but that that was irrelevant because without no disrespect to anyone else there wasn't any competition it, there was no one else who'd raced professionally or elite or I won by two hours it wasn't a race it was just purely for fun there was no prize money there was no cheering and 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 it was just me against myself in this beautiful part of the world and and that was like the perfect way to to help me realize that I I still want to do stuff purely just for that feeling um but it's also helped me step away from kind of you know the and I I've never done it to make money at all and and I've always been really kind of surprised when that I have made money from it but but it's hard to walk away from something that you love when you are making quite significant amounts of money from it. So Patagonia was like the best possible transition, <laughs> really. What do you? I, we will talk more about Patagonia because it just sounds um, incredible and all the photos looked amazing. But what do you think you'll miss the most? Well, I don't... I think I'm still going to... I, I think that... I, I didn't. I never planned to become a professional athlete, um, and like I said, I, I don't really see myself as having been a professional athlete the last year or so. Um, but the 
bit that I've always loved is is the the being out of your comfort zone and and actually I think that's why the last you know this year particularly even though it's races that I've done before they I've been out of my comfort zone because I've had I've trained so much less I've had so much else going on like like Wales this year I, I had my final medical exams the Wednesday before Wales so so I hadn't I literally hadn't even thought about Ireland Wales until Thursday morning I wake up and thought shit I've got to sort out all my you know my bike and everything but that that for me I, I was talking to a friend driving up there that put me out of my comfort zone and it made it a challenge and I'd won Wales twice before and it yes it was it's always going to be a challenge to win I remember it wouldn't have been quite the same challenge if I'd had a perfect run up and and so the bits that I you know like rocking up to Lanza and seventy point well that or both Lanza race any of the races that I've I've rocked up at and it, I've just I've just been out of my comfort zone and and I think that's what I love and Patagonia made me realise that I can still do that very easily <laughs> like you know I might might have got quite quick but there are so many other ways to get out of your comfort zone rather than just racing the best in the world and. And the other thing is it's not about winning. And I know I won Patagonia, but really that was that was so irrelevant. And if I was racing it, I would have been racing the guys. And, you know, maybe I'd wanted to finish a couple of places higher because, you know, I'd been in a race with the guys. But it's it's not about that. It's about that personal satisfaction. And I think that's I think that's why I, I yeah, I just feel like I'm probably the luckiest pro athlete because that's the driving force behind it and there are so many other ways to get that rather than just doing professional kind of professional inverted commas races um and I I guess when you say professional you mean I I guess I'm talking about the challenge in the Ironman series um but yeah but I can't remember what the question was sorry (laughs) (laughs) right I I what will you miss the most and but when you were talking there with um in your answer I was thinking your fellow athletes must have, on one hand, a ridiculous amount of respect for you in terms of, oh my goodness, um, you know, this woman has, she's a cancer doctor, she's doing incredible things part of the week, and then, you know, something like I am on Wales, you're able to kind of not not really think about it until the Thursday, but then you still go and absolutely smash the others who turn up and they're just like, oh my God. <laughs> but, yeah, but do you know what? They probably, well, they probably do hate me, but, or they probably think I make it all up. <laughs> but um, I, I was talking to a friend who's also helped me some sports psychology when I was driving up to Wales. And I was talking to her as a friend, not as a psychologist. But um, I said, do you know, I actually feel sorry for everyone else racing because for them it's so important what the result of the race is. And for me, it really is, it's not irrelevant. Obviously, I wanted to go out there and I wanted to do my best. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. Of course, in a dream, I would win it. But if I didn't win, I'd go back to work. I'd have done my, there were other things, so many other things in my life. And I, I definitely have been, have enjoyed racing so much more since I've been back at work. Um, and I, I don't think I was a good professional athlete in Mercy Commas because I wasn't good at just being an, an athlete and having that as the only focus. Um, and actually this year, you know, staffs, I came, like I came fifth. I was just, I was just one of those days. I was just completely empty, but I'm, I'm just, I'm probably more, well, just as proud of that race as I am of any of the races that I've won because it was such, such a tough day, but I still finished it and I still kept going and, um I think I got as much respect from people actually for finishing it as I did for winning races so um yeah it's definitely not the winning that that makes me keep going I don't think I don't think I will miss much I guess I'll be missed being right at the peak of my game but I haven't been at the peak of my game for like three years definitely so um I don't think I'm yeah I don't think I'll miss that much because yeah I'll still challenge myself Love it. What and is there anything that you'll miss the least? I thought what I loved about Patagonia was that I went and I travelled because as a, a full time athlete, when you when you go to a race, generally you um, you get like, so lots of people said to me, "Why are you doing Patagonia? Why don't you go to Argentina, which is the week before?" Because there's loads of prize money, and you know they're just like you're bonkers. You can make money in Patagonia, and that's kind of the professional athlete kind of statement. Why are you doing that? Um, and 
like I have good friends with Susie Cheatham and, and Susie obviously went out, I think she was second, but she went out, she sat in the hotel room, she trained on the turbo, she did the race and she came home again the next day. And that that's work, that's not travel. Whereas I went to Patagonia and I had the most like the most money can't buy experience like that. The most incredible two weeks and I saw this most incredible country and had all these experiences that will stay with me forever and you know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna when I'm when I'm dying. I'm not gonna look back and think, oh, I wish I went to Argentina and sat in a hotel room. I'm gonna look back and think, wow, Patagonia was incredible. I'm so lucky that I had that experience. So, um, yeah, I think it's opening doors rather than closing them. <laughs> so, Patagon man, then you obviously knew earlier last year that you're gonna be doing it. Can you? You've said it was just out of this world. Can you tell us a little bit more about what? the race was like and what the I guess what the actual place was like so when when you first arrived I don't know if it was day or night but that moment where you sort of look and you're like oh my god well it was all the better because I'd had a nightmare journey um and and then classic Lucy like (laughs) I get like I've been I'd applied for this job um and I had submitted it at the airport I literally hadn't thought about this race (laughs) I hadn't even read the race manual, and when you open the until I got on the plane, when you open the race, which sounds ridiculous, but I, sometimes I'm, I'm stupider than than I come across. Um, anyway, the first thing it says in this race manual: by the time you get to Patagonia, you should know the context of this inside out, upside down, back to front. I was like, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I should have read the race manual, but um, yeah, it's just. I mean, the, the town that your the t- race is based out of, or where everyone stays, is is nothing special. I mean, you kind of get there, and there's lovely mountains and things around. The town itself is um, is just a town. Um, but but <laughs> then you drive out, and honestly, you Louise Vincent's husband described it as sensory overload, and it's the best the best race that I heard um, because you just don't know where to look, and and every time you see something, and and then you're like, but like my eyes I just it's it's just overwhelming these views and and it's not just a you know normally you climb a mountain you get a view and that's very nice and then you go down again this is just everywhere like the the normal the boring bits of Chile and Patagonia are just spectacular and the spectacular bits are just they're just unbelievable I I can't I can, words can't do it justice um and and it's so quiet as well so so you hear everything there's not there's not cars, there's not people, there's, you know, you just get a tiny bit off the beaten track and all you can hear is, you know, bees buzzing and cows mooing and birds doing their thing. And, and then you notice the smells as well. Like the, they have all these the lupins, these purple lupins, but, but because it's so quiet, I think you absorb it all so much more than you would normally. I, I just, I honestly, I, I was completely blown away and, one of the things I would love to do is is cycle tour down this road because we we saw loads of cycle tours and that just looked incredible. Um, but yeah, the race the race was just it was just so different. And if you're looking for, a, I mean, these extreme tries, I'm I'm really drawn to them this year. And there are some there are so many around the world. And um, an Ironman is is wonderful and it's fantastic and it's definitely an experience. But if you're not if you're not doing it to be competitive, you know you're competitive against yourself rather than competitive against you to get to Kona. Then there are so many other cool races that are are offer such a, a different experience. Um, and so this like had 200 people starting, I think. I think they have 300 entrants, and obviously people pull out. Um, and you go on on this boat, and uh, like we we had to get up at 1:30 or something to drive. To, to the start which is now in quarter away because it's point to point so obviously just it's a, a bit of hassle but actually that adds to the whole fun of the race and then you're on this ferry and we were like we were going mental having a disco and it was we it was just brilliant and and then we saw the pictures and, and everyone else was just like looking really serious and lying down in the boat but we were we were having great time it was that was probably the highlight um, and then you jump off the boat, and it's a blooming high jump as well. And you're kind of like standing there, going, "Oh my god!" It was like it was just as good as walking into the water at Kona. 
Um, and then the swim was lovely. It actually wasn't that cold. I think it was 12 degrees or something. Um, Serbal wetsuits make a massive difference. Um, and then the bike, I mean, the bike, it's, I think it's a little bit short. Um, it's about, it's not that tough. It's about as tough as Wales or Lanza. Um, we, there are bits that are kind of cobbled and loads of potholes and dogs and things. And there were actually some roadworks that are for about a K or two K, so it's rubble bit, but, um, it's not super tough. Um, it depends a bit on the wind. I think we lucked out on the wind, but it's just spectacularly beautiful. Um, and for me, there was there was literally there was no one 15 minutes behind or ahead. So I was just riding and, you know, I wasn't getting filmed. I wasn't getting cheered. Or, you know, now normally Peter, like Tom, my friend, he's like, you don't have to race, Goss. You're just getting cheered around. But it was just pure racing, like raw racing. Um, and I, I had a support person um, from Patagonia who's amazing. So you could meet her because there's no aid stations three times on the bike um and get water and i've taken a spare tub actually so i had to each time i saw i had to down a bottle because my rear bottle cage had a spare tub in um and then the run and this is where i should have read the mace annual because i'd got my normal racing (laughs) running shoes and um the aid stations their water stations 10k apart so i was like 10k yeah i'll be fine but it was it was really hot like we were so lucky with the weather but pretty like it was i think it was 32 the day before but I think it was about 26, 27 on the run. So it was a hot. Um, and you kind of set off and didn't have any way of carrying water in my shoes. I was like, oh, this is fine. And, and then you get on what you think is a trail. You're like, this is fine. A little bit of rubble. And, and then you get on the proper trail. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, I don't. I actually. So I've never walked. I don't think I've ever walked in Nine Man, apart from in Kona when I was injured. I, I don't think I've ever walked full stop, apart from possibly through a couple of aid stations for like literally four seconds, four seconds or something. Um, but these hills, <laughs> you at there, I'm sure I was quicker walking. Um, and, and there were, again, there was no one around. I passed one guy from the PWAG racing team. And other than that, I didn't see anyone, um, apart from at the, the water stations and then a car and the last kind of 12 K the support team can come up to, can drive back to the 30 K so they can, you see cars then um and so it's a bit more populated then but the first 10k i mean the first 10k took me something like an hour and four minutes um which shows what it's like <laughs> and i thought i'm not i wasn't in a a race shape but um it was just it was just amazing it was and and i just i felt like an ultra runner and i was just looking around going this is incredible. I'm I'm just so lucky to be here. And because there's no one, there's no one there as well. It's just you. And then you get to this. They said you cross the river, and I kind of like, yeah, right. You cross the river. There'll be a little stream. <laughs> anyway, we get to this full blown river. I'm like, because again, you're on your own. There's no marshals or anything. I'm like, nah. There, and there must be a <laughs> there must be a way around this. And kind of walking around. I looked at my Strava like two minutes walking around there trying to find the the like crossing. <laughs> I was like, all oh, right, we really are going through this. So you're going across this proper river, like way, way higher than my knees. <laughs> like, it was just amazing. Um, and obviously, because you don't have water, then oh, I didn't have water. You've got to manage all of that yourself as well. Um, so I think other people had like bladder packs and stuff. Yeah, I think that the... was in the race manual. Um, yes, it was. <laughs> but uh, um, I think the the um, yeah the the walking on the hills actually was pretty essential because otherwise I would have um, overheated and obviously you can't cool down like you can normally in Nine Man and just pour water over yourself. But honestly, there are so many cool races out there, um, and Patagonia was the organisers did such an amazing job at, for a first time event. It was just so well run. Um, and they, you know, the, the prize actually was two days in the spa, this luxury spa. So Joe, and you can only get there by boat. Joe and I, my friend, um, got race. Had a, we had a wonderful time there, and then, um, then we stayed in this cabin. Oh, it was just incredible. Yeah, do do different races um, rather than just doing Ironmans. I'm so glad I've discovered them. <laughs> Keltman, Norseman, are they are they on the on the list? Oh, there's hundreds. There's there Swiss honestly man. there's. Canada man, Manx man, there's one in the Island man, um, and they all just look. God, that yeah, I I can be out of my comfort zone a million times more than I was in you know doing Ironman UK or or something like that. Um, 
yeah, there were so many to choose from. Um, and and things like, you know, Ombra Man, Norse Man. I, I think you just said Norse Man. Um, there's this Taiwan Com, which is, have you heard of that? No, This no. is a, oh, this looks so Is brilliant. this going on the list as well? This is, yeah, this is very high up of a potential list. So it's a, it's a bike race in Taiwan. It's basically 105k uphill. Um, it literally is 105k uphill. It looks is it incredible. That, has Emma Pooley done it? Yeah, and repeating. Yeah. I think she normally wins it or comes yeah. like first and second, um, but that's definitely high up my my kind of potential list. Um, yeah, they were like, oh, I'm doing a swim run as well. I've entered that because um, swimming's one? obviously my forte. Yeah, the Silly Isles. Um, nice. Yeah, with a guy I used to live with at university actually. Who, funnily enough, he spent all of university trying to get me to do pentathlon because he was a pentathlete. And to do running and stuff. And I was always like, oh, I can't do stuff like that. And um, finally, however <laughs> many years later, we're doing something together. So that'd be cool. Oh, that's sort of summertime, isn't it? That is in June. Um, but all this, these is, things... this is exciting, hearing about your, <laughs> you know, the new <laughs> the new calendar. I know, I know. But all the, I kind of think all the, yeah, it all... I, this year, I stayed fit by racing lots, which is how I managed to get results. And... So I kind of think if I stay fit doing fun stuff, then I'll be able to do some, you know, some random things. And, who, you know, I, I'll i be fit enough to enter anything and just go and have a good time, which is all I wanted to do in Patagonia was be fit enough to enjoy it, um, which I was. <laughs> so if, if anyone listening to this has any crazy ideas, um, I managed to convince Lucy to do the Engadin Cross Country Ski Marathon with just a simple text. So I'm sure <laughs> so, I'm sure she'll be up for anything. Um, Otterlo was exactly the same, actually. <laughs> there you go. So random text. She'll sign up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, Lucy, a few questions um, from uh, listeners. Alfredo Argueta, I think we've a- answered this one, says, will we have the privilege and honour of seeing Lucy race Kona once again? A fit and healthy Lucy Gossage is someone we would see on the podium. Oh, that's very kind. Um, you definitely wouldn't see me on the podium there. Um, that is very kind, but um, I know where you know. I know where I potentially could have finished, but and I don't think the podium would be there. Um, no, I don't think I will go back to Kona. I did cross my mind at Wales to take the slot and just go and do it in my adventure year, but um, I actually thought it would be a bit selfish because there are so many other people wanting to go there. Um, and also, it, I don't think I would be able to just go there and and. I wouldn't let myself just go there and rock up. Um, so, no, you won't see me in Kona. David Irwin, what does it feel like to do a Lucy on the finish line? Um, amazing. They're never planned. It's just the emotions that come out. Um, but, yes, yeah. Yeah, You. Can't, I, I, I think that actually you asked me what I miss, and I will miss that. I will miss winning a big race because you can't ever... Uh, you can't. I, 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 I've tried to bottle all those memories, and particularly in Wales this year. Um, you know, they're having a motorbike riding next to you, and everyone cheering your name, and these weird experiences that you, that you just—they're so surreal that you you describe to someone in your day life, and you you, you just can't describe it. So I think I, I will miss, I will miss that. Um, but you. In that very few people even ever get those experiences um and they're they're bottled and videoed thankfully <laughs> um so i will be able to relive them <laughs> nottage ironman says do you think that long course athletes would benefit if british triathlon stopped concentrating on short course distances I feel very strongly that the best long course athlete should get medical uh, expenses covered Um, because I think that was one of the things that limited me and um, I think British Triathlon, I don't don't think we should get funding because actually we can make more money through sponsorship than the short course athletes and we're not, you know, we're completely flexible in our races and our training um, so that we have lots of perks that the Olympic distance athletes don't have. But um, I do think the top, maybe even just the top three in the country, male and female, should should have a grant to cover medical ex- medical expenses um, because they do publicise our our success, and I think that would make a big difference to a lot of athletes. Um, 
so that's yeah that's all i think we should get probably sensible suggestion um lucy last one from um listeners is to do with work dave and sarah and cara basically all say how do you find they're all doctors or they're interested in the answer sarah at least is a doctor how do you find such motivation to fit your training around such draining work days you know i'm also a doctor and a draining day often puts paid two sessions i think the first thing to say is that i do only work part-time um so i have more time than most doctors and i do my hard stuff in the morning because i i know that in the evening after work you just can't guarantee getting it done you know if the clinic overruns and it's half past seven and the thought of going for your run is too much then i i, I just make sure that they're all the bonus sessions that i have in the evening so do the hard stuff in the morning um but i think my my main advice to anyone and they, i get asked this a lot obviously is is how you motivate yourself and actually if you know why you're doing it then the motivation's easy so if you've got a goal then generally the motivation is easy um and i guess you just have to keep the training as fun as you as you can so swim with the club and things rather than on your own um but yeah it's not easy i know it's not easy <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie and pretend it is easy let's say when you were doing your phd or the couple of years before then when you you know you were a very very successful um athlete and and you're working as well how did you do that so I've, I've actually only had two and a half years as a full-time athlete. So I've been a pro, I started racing pro in right, right at the end of 2011. Um, but in, so in all that time, I've only ever had two and a half years as a full-time athlete. Um, and I think, uh, I think I just used to overtrain a bit when, <laughs> when I was a full-time athlete. Um, so when I was doing my PhD, it was a lot easier because you're very flexible. So you manage your own time um, and you had the odd meeting, but, Generally, you could go running at lunchtime if you wanted to, and you know you could go in late or finish late, or it was all up to up to you. Um, being a doctor, uh, you know, a practicing doctor, obviously you can't say, "Well, it's sunny, I'm going to do clinic in the afternoon." <laughs> so you ha- you're you're very fixed, and you don't get a lunch hour, and the days are much longer. Um, so it's much harder working clinically. Um, but I think. I mean, people that people assume that I have a, a a plan and and I don't actually I do kind of make it up but I think that's kind of I think that's quite essential because the flexibility and the adaptability but if I had a plan and I didn't finish till 7 30 and I was exhausted then I'd feel really guilty that I hadn't managed to do the session um so I have a vague plan but it's it's much more flexible than um than people might might imagine um i think the i think the the biggest thing actually is is new, well probably the biggest thing for me is nutrition um and it's a thing i hate the most and i always said if i could have one sponsor be someone to give me all my food ready prepared really healthy and nutritious <laughs> because oh, you you must remember this from you well from work that you get in at nine and you're shattered and you've got to get up at half five but you've also got to cook your dinner and make your Tupperware breakfast and make your Tupperware lunch. <laughs> and that's just such a chore, isn't it? It is. But you live out of Tupperware. Yeah, but it's so essential. Because when I used to do triathlon before as an age grouper, like I, as I was in Nottingham before and then I went to Cambridge for the PhD and that's why I got good at triathlon, then was full-time athlete and then came back to Nottingham. But it's quite interesting because nothing's changed in Nottingham. And obviously I'm, I kind of, in my head, compare what I used to do. Um, and I used, to, I used to get to work and I'd eat a bagel with peanut butter and then I'd have the same at lunch and then at dinner I'd have pasta with tomato sauce because that's what I kind of thought you needed, carbohydrates, athletes, carbohydrates and it was easy and, and now I'm, I'm, I know I have to be good with nutrition and even though no matter how busy you are at work, you like yesterday I had I was in clinic from nine till I didn't finish the morning clinic till half past two. And then the afternoon clinic was meant to start at two. But I, I said, well, I've got, to, I'm, I'm taking 20 minutes and I made the salad and I'm going to eat it. And, and I've learned, I'm more, I'm wiser that you can't just go through a day without having a break and you can't get through on peanut butter and bagel and, you know, the odd Cadbury's chocolate bar or whatever. Um, and, and so having that 20 minute break and eating your, your salad with couscous and salmon or whatever that you made the night before makes the work day so much more manageable and you're better doctor in the afternoon to the patients you're seeing for that 20 minute break 
Um, but it also means then that probably, you know, I didn't train last night. I'm not really training now anyway, but had I been, even though I had a race, I wouldn't have trained last night because I was knackered. But having eaten well, you're not then wiped out the next day when you might have a proper training session that you need to do. So nutrition's, yeah, it's definitely the, the fourth discipline for working athletes. And that and sleep are probably far more important than the extra swim session, um, I would say. But I've learned from trial and error. <laughs> Lots of errors. <laughs> <laughs> wise words, um, Lucy. Very, very wise words. We're going to leave it there. And I look forward to doing the Engadin Cross Country <laughs> Ski Marathon with you in a couple what of months' are you time. Like? I know. Oh, God. It's, it's exciting, though, isn't it? But um, yes. yeah, a certain Chrissy Wellington's also doing it and going off secret training camps. So um, <laughs> let that no longer be secret either. <laughs> <laughs> that um, random Chrissy Wellington <laughs> it's going to be good fun right see you there see you in Switzerland um, cool thanks for having me on the show <laughs> thanks for all your support over the years as well Rob really interesting comments from um, Lucy at the end there about actually her training and how she feels that she probably used to overtrain a little bit yeah um, we've heard from Lucy a number of times on this podcast and the one thing that I always think of when, um, you know, when you're talking to Lucy or, or when you sort of see her racing is that she really hammers home about doing stuff for fun. Yeah. Yeah, she really races with joy, doesn't she? She's very, very focused as she's racing. But to see her in the finishing shoe and see that she just really, really enjoys running, biking and swimming and and I think we'll see her continue to do crazy stuff like this in the future because she really enjoys doing it. Exactly, that is it. So going out the comfort zone, but just making that a part of your life as as much as you know all of her um, oncology work as well. So yeah, yeah, brilliant, amazing athlete, amazing person, and uh, <laughs> roll on Engadin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing that, Hells. Oh my God, uh, Rob! A bit of news to uh, finish with, um, and actually linked yeah. quite nicely actually with um, with the interview with Lucy Gossage because Ironman Wales has sold out. Is it the first time ever it sold out? So they sold out last year in August, but yeah, but it wasn't the... far before, was it? Yeah. No, this is the quickest they've ever sold out. So this is what first second week of January. Yeah, I mean that's crazy because quite often people would almost decide a bit later on, wouldn't they? Go, yeah, I'm just going to go and give Wales a go. Um, yeah, but clearly it's actually people are thinking, yeah, I want, I want a challenge, or you know, it's got such a, it's such an incredible race, it's got such an impressive reputation that that's exactly it, isn't it? People, it. people are saying we really want to go and do this, and I think in the early days it, it suffered as being kind of the second event in the UK to Ironman UK yeah. and these days it's got such an amazing reputation for its its location the stunning views the 10 be locals and just just the general awesomeness of the course itself that it's yeah was it was at 2800 slots they sold out last year I think I read yeah, somewhere 2800 and about 2400 um actually started yeah um, so yeah, if um, I I started looking actually, Rob, I intend my plan if if all all is well, um, I intend to go down there again like I did this year and um, you know, be there, do some cheering on, gather some interviews. So that's that's the plan. Um, nice. Figure out some accommodation. Um, so that's my project for this week. I think try and book something. I was looking yesterday, and even when I went down this year, I stayed a night in a youth hostel. Um, not too far away on the Saturday night, but I booked it quite late. I looked yeah. yes, I don't know. I looked a few days ago, and I'm like, oh my god, there's nothing. So yeah, yeah. I need to get on that. Um, big man's Iron Man. When uh, he heard the news, he said, no, 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 no. He said, this very <laughs> morning, I had the choice of entering Wales or a last minute place on the next triathlon coaching level one course. After all, he thought Wales won't be selling out just yet. Oh dear. Oh um, bless. And Gary Vaughan said that he's in and he's looking forward to it and uh, he's looking forward to us keeping him company on his long runs as well. Good stuff. 
Well, that's it, everyone. We we talked the last few weeks about how how awesome it can be to get yourself entered into an event and have that inspiration to go and do something really fun. We talked about that when we had the Outlaw on, and there's another event that sold out on Christmas Day, so that's that's completely gone for this year. It feels like it feels like event organising kind of there was like a bust and boom thing, wasn't it? With all of a sudden there were loads more events, and then they went through a phase of nothing selling out, and then. I wonder whether some events have gone away and this is a reflection that some events are now going to be like the premier ones that sell out really quickly again. Mm. And maybe we'll, we'll either start seeing more events again or people are just going to have to be much more decisive in getting quicker for the events that they do want to do. But it's a good thing that there are people who are saying, I, I think the Ironman distance in particular is one where people, they go to do it because they want to achieve something massive and it's symbolic of more than just doing lots of swimming, biking and run training, which in itself is awesome, but it represents something a lot bigger than just doing some training for people, doesn't it? It's a it's a gateway into a, if I can do this, I can do anything mindset. So I think it's great to see it expanding into more people realizing it's something that they can reach and something that they can achieve. And certainly I remember when I did my first one in 2003, I was down in Australia at the time and all the people at the tri club I was training with were going, you're nowhere near experienced enough to try and do an Ironman, son. You've got to do years and years of this. And that was the, that was the mindset back then. You've got to earn your right to do an Ironman by doing loads and loads of years of training. And now people are going, no, we can do this. Come on, let's get in. It'll be a good thing to lose some weight. And I think it's great. The, the bigger bites of stuff people chew, the more they've got to get into. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a bit like you know in the what the 1980s lots of people started doing marathons and it's and it's that similar thing it's like that challenge isn't it but yeah. you know it's almost now like well you've ticked off the marathon you might have ticked off something else and you want another challenge and you know in in down in that corner of um southwest wales it's almost like a <laughs> like a rite of passage isn't it yeah you know you speak yeah. to if you live in Tembe, half the exactly. half the town must have done it, right? Exactly, and um, yeah, I think for a number of people, you know, they, they enter it and it might be their first ever triathlon. Yeah, that's now not uncommon, is it? Yeah. So yeah, there you yeah, go. good, good stuff. How exciting! Loads more, loads more people chasing the dreams. It's only got to be a good thing. Definitely. I love it. Definitely. Right, give us an update on Fuel by Cake Hells. How are you getting on? Oh, a couple more sold over the past week. Yep, yeah, a few Excellent. more sold. So um, I think about, I don't know, 80-odd left in the box. That's great. Seriously, that's so good. I like to think that it's not just a book being sold, but somewhere out there, someone's sitting and enjoying some cake that they've made because of that. That's the reality of it. Someone's come in from a ride or a run and eating a cake that they've made, and it doesn't get a lot better than that. I'm a man of simple pleasures, Hells. Well, honestly, even today, I got a message from someone who said, um, Helen, my sister loved your book and she wants another one as a present for a friend who's a running enthusiast. So there you go. Nice. Yeah. That's what and it made me giggle the number of people on the Facebook group who said, have you got any copies of the first one left or will you get it printed? Because I want that one as well. So soon, Hells, fueled by more cake, is going to have that same iconic status and there's none left. What iconic? <laughs> Maybe people should be buying extra copies and they can sell them on eBay when the demand rises. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm liking your thinking. Always thinking. Yeah. Always think too much thinking. That's my problem. All right, let's wrap this up. People are fed up of listening to us. Wrap it on. <laughs> Always. Always. All right, so we've got to say thanks to our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. Remember, you've got the code OxygenAddict. gets you um, £9.99 worth of free product. Fueledbycake.com. You can get yourself super slices of delicious cake. You can even get one designed by my nan, who's not with us anymore. That will, Her memory will live on in your cake. In when the you make it, walnut loaf. <laughs> it is good actually, though, Hells. To be fair, joking aside, it's all good. And also, Team Oxygen Addict is open again. If you want to get yourself some coaching for one of these inspirational events this year, get yourself over to teamoxygenaddict.com. And if you get in before Friday the 18th, you're going to be able to get in at 2018 prices. So don't mess about, kids. When that's gone, it's gone as well. 
So listen, until next week, have a great safe training and racing week. Try not to enter any crazy ski marathons like Helen unless you know what you're doing. Do you do coaching for it, Rob? For ski marathons? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> How hard can it be? Go rollerblading. <laughs> I wonder, I bet somebody does somewhere. I bet. I, I don't I bet want coaching. Seriously. I bet, there's, I bet there's somebody like me somewhere making a living from coaching people f- just specifically for that event. That's how Honestly, awesome the world is. No, don't don't go there. We're going to have a lesson before we go. Uh, I mean, sorry, we're going to have a lesson when we get out there the day before. Day, yeah, and then just give it a crack. Give it another crack. I'd It'll be fine. We've all got to fitness. Do. It will be yeah. fine. Love and somewhere out there, someone's listening to this right now, going, "Oh, I don't know whether I should enter this or not. I'm a bit scared." Just get in and enter it. If these three crazy lunatics can enter the ski marathon then you can (laughs) all right so until next week everyone i'm coach rob wilby and i'm helen murray you've been listening to the oxygen addict triathlon podcast i hope we've inspired you a little bit until next week well see you soon see ya